Hi, everybody, and welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight to our last uh, education event of the season. And welcome to the Eastern Sierra Avalanche Center forecasters who are helping to put this on this evening. Uh, my name is Mike Phillips, and I work as the education coordinator for, for ESAC. And we've had a great season of putting these events on this year virtually, and really excited to get these going in person again sometime soon. So fingers crossed for, for next season. Um, if you're new to the area or new to ESAC or new to our events, just a little bit about us. We are a nonprofit avalanche forecast center based here in the Eastern Sierra. Uh, we have three full-time forecasters, two of which are here tonight. And part of us being a, a nonprofit organization is that we're really supported by you guys. We're supported by your donations and most importantly by your participation and showing up tonight is a, a real big deal for us to know that the community is out here supporting us. So thanks for coming out. Uh, part of the participation that we're looking for to help us to continue to fund this nonprofit center is uh, support for a grant that we've applied for again this year from the California State Parks from the OHV program. Um, if you're willing and able, please consider um, participating in the public comment period, which is going on for another month or so until May 3rd, and instructions for how to submit comments to the state of California are here on our website. Um, you'll see the, the red circle there indicating the, the link to that page. And feel free to reach out if you have any questions um, as far as what helps and uh, how to fill out the, the comment page on their website. In addition to that, we're looking to get to know our, our members and our community a little bit more. And we still have a travel and training survey that's available on our website. It takes just a couple minutes to fill out and uh, it really helps us to get a handle on what people are using on the ESAC website and what things you'd like us to see um, add um, services and anything else you can consider. So please also uh, take that survey. Again, it just takes a couple minutes and that's available on our website under the current discussions page there. And lastly, tonight's event is uh, the last one in our, in our free education events series that's been going on all winter. Um, tonight we're uh, we have Josh Feinberg and Steve Mace, Avalanche Forecasters for ESAC, here to discuss springtime travel advice and some avalanche considerations to um, keep in mind while you're out there traveling in the mountains in the springtime. So with that, I'll say thanks again and I'll pass it over to Josh. Right. And we can start. <clears throat> Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, well, it's springtime in the Sierra. It's uh, quite warm out there. The snow is unfortunately melting, but still there in a lot of places. Um, but yeah, what better place to be than the Sierra in the springtime for some corn skiing and to be out in the fresh warm air. Um, yeah, well, we'll get going here. You have a good slideshow for you tonight and um, we're going to go through, thing, through things and if you guys have questions please write them up in the chat and uh, Mike will bring them up for us during the show and we'll also have a couple periods during the show to, uh, to specifically ask questions. Um, Steve, Steve, take it from here. Right on. Well, good evening everybody. We're, um, we're going to kind of start by reviewing the 2020-2021 season in numbers. So uh, we'll start with three. Three is the number of ESAC forecasters that we currently employ here at ESAC. Um, I am one of them. Josh is also our lead forecaster. And Chris Englehart is the third. Um, 228, which is the number of inches of snowfall we got this season so far. There's always a chance for more. April has provided in the past. Um, 
you know, when we look at it compared to other recent seasons, we're definitely, we're not quite the lowest in terms of precip, but we're, we're pretty, we're not, certainly not the highest either. So, um, yeah, we could definitely use some more, but working with what we got and thankful we have some coverage to work with as spring rolls on. Two, the number of high danger days this season. And that occurred during our, our uh, mega snor storm, kind of the end of January, early February. We, re we received 96 inches of snow in, in a 60 hour period um, here at Mammoth Mountain. And uh, yeah, sandwiching a, an extreme danger day, which we haven't seen in a couple seasons. 48 is the number of low danger days that we've had this season. End of the spectrum there. Um, and here's a good look at our, our uh, snow depth chart. If you guys are familiar with the, the weather sensor app on our website, it's under the resources tab and it's a really handy tool. And these are a lot of the uh, snow tail sites in the forecast area that all are kind of conveniently located in, in one place. Um, and you can kind of get a good look at, at uh, how things are stacking up out there. You can see how there's a lot of these flat sections between these spikes, and that's uh, what we can attribute all of that low danger to. Um, not low always during those flat sections, but uh, definitely we had a, low, a, lot, a lot of low dangers. And one other thing is we had during those low danger times in the beginning of the season where it's these faceting snowpack, the, these loose crystals, sugary crystals that were forming at the base, um, which we're not really worried about right now, um, but we'll touch back on that later. 37. Uh, this is an unfortunate number, but this is the amount of people who unfortunately passed away in avalanche accidents in the United States this season. Um, it certainly was a, a rough season. Um, all across the West, we experienced those, those weak faceted grains, um, even here in California, and, and um, persistent slab avalanches were, were to blame for quite a few of these fatalities. Um, so we certainly here at ESAC want to give our condolences to the friends and family and, and hope these, these folks rest in peace. Um, but luckily we have not seen any deaths here on the east side um, so far this season and let's keep it that way. Um, thanks for making it a safe season so far and let's, let's keep it a safe spring as we transition into the next season. Thanks, Steve. So now what you guys are all here to listen to is um, some springtime avalanches, uh, what they're all about. Um, it's definitely a different kind of situation than we have during the rest of the year. Um, I'm going to start this off with a video here um, that was taken last year uh, on April 11th. This actually was a, an accident that occurred in the Paiute Crags uh, right in the middle of the COVID lockdown. Um, but these, these snowboarders, um, Ben Peck, especially, who is, and features in this film, um, was gracious enough and vulnerable enough to put this together with uh, another guy named Ben Ditto. Um, and this is a, quite an excellent film they have, and I hope you all can learn something from it. Hey, Josh, maybe check the audio. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Josh, you might have to restart your screen share and turn on okay. the audio when you do that. Let's see. Uh, can you guys see this? and see what we see and go. That's working. You guys see the video, video now? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Mm -hmm. 
The height of the pandemic was during that time. It felt so good to be in the mountains. It was a sunny day and we just had a storm. We were psyched to go ride some powder together. The only plan was to like go into this zone and see what we see and go snowboard it. The first day when we went up to the Emerson Coulard, we went up and ski cutted the slope and poked around and it, everything seemed all systems go. <laughs> but for the following day, the day of my accident, the sun was out and things were rapidly warming. Curly and I had talked about that line in particular. We discussed the consequence of it, and then we also discussed conditions that were happening at that time with the rapid warming. We decided that I would snowboard and Curly would stay at the bottom and film it. When I was strapped in, I felt some uncertainty, which, you know, that's a red flag. It wasn't bottomless pal by any means. It was pretty shallow. And that's what I was scared of is hitting rocks while making my first turn. You know, I had the feeling of I could step back from it, but at the same time, I also kind of put myself in a position that would be, it would be tough to reverse, you know? I could have done it, but it wouldn't have been easy. Everything was feeling good, and then rolling over into that panel that had all the sun. You know, I was hitting rocks. It just felt so heavy. I'm going to die from just sheer force of this thing. When the lights go out, it helps you accept that you're going to die. That feeling of giving up was um, the worst thing I've ever experienced. I mean, it created this huge powder cloud that you could see from so far. I mean, crews could see it back from camp. You know, I, I didn't know if Curly was out of harm's way down there. I felt terrible putting him in that, in that situation of having to deal with that. You know, he's just like, he didn't even know if I went off the cliffs or not. Get out of there, dude. I gotta go. That was like the last thing I wanted to do before I like, departed from Earth was create pain for people. You're thinking about all these things and it's only been a few seconds. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
once I stopped in all the debris and I could see a little bit of daylight, I could move my hand and that was about it. And I immediately just went into fight or flight mode of, I need to get the snow out of my mouth ASAP so I can breathe. <laughs> I had somehow got flipped around in that avalanche. So when I got unburied, I'm looking directly at the line. It was almost like that mountain was taunting me or telling me like, that's what you get when you uh, fail to take all the precautions. You know, most of the more badass ski films out there, it's someone getting chased down a steep mountain with an avalanche behind them and then making it to the bottom of their run and giving their homie a high five and saying how close that was, but they, they're totally fine. Those are a lot of talented skiers and snowboarders. And um, it's, it's a dream when it works out, but it doesn't always. And sometimes it's good to highlight the, the failures out there, such as mine. Anything broken? No. No? Oh, wait. Yeah. I paid attention to my surroundings. I just neglected to apply that to my decision. I had made a huge mistake and it almost cost me, made me realize that I don't need to push trying to ride stuff like that. I don't even need to push riding on days that are unsafe, you know? Um, it's also changed me as far as realizing that it's not only myself if I get hurt or injured, but it's the people around me and my family and friends are also going to have that reverberate out to them. So, oh, so So very, very happy that Ben made it out of that one. Um, as you guys can see, it was a very, very close call and extremely fortunate. And he learned a lot in that avalanche. And again, we thank him for sharing with us so that we can learn from it and um, hopefully have less of a chance of someone else um, making a mistake like that one. Um, this is just a little review of what the weather was during that time. You can see that um, from April 5th to 6th, there was 15 inches of new snow, and then a, a day break, and then 22 inches of new snow. So there's quite a lot of new snow. And there was a day of, uh, of not really snowing, but cloudy and just unsettled weather. Uh, but then the day of the avalanche, it was the first sunny bluebird day, as he said, with calm winds and a high of 44 degrees at, at 1250. So that was a significant rapid warming with new fresh snow, um, which is a pretty big red flag. Um, so this is another avalanche that occurred that same season last year on April 29th. This is on University Peak um, outside of Onion, Onion Valley um, Trailhead. And uh, this was not after a fresh snowfall. This is no, no real no, new snow for quite a while. Um, but this avalanche occurred, if you can see my cursor, uh, this part party of two uh, started off um, in the morning uh, climbing up this big gully and they made it up to around here. Um, they were actually transitioning at this point from skinning to booting because it was getting steeper. So they were off to the side and some rocks. Um, 
and they were, had their backpacks off, putting their skis in their bag. And uh, when this avalanche above them, presumably starting as like a loose wet slide coming off of these little rocks up here, um, triggered a wet slab avalanche that came down and hit both of them. Um, one of them was able to hold on to his rock and not get swept down, but his partner uh, wasn't able to. And when she was swept down probably um, over 1500 feet and ended up down in this section, uh, fortunately, not buried, but uh, she suffered a, a broken broken back among among other injuries. Um, the first guy who was up up high, he was able to boot back down um, um, with his transceiver, but unfortunately, he didn't have a shovel or probe because his backpack got swept away as well. So fortunately, she wasn't buried, and he was able to find her. And then at that point, uh, search and rescue was called, and they ended up. Um, coming in with a helicopter to, to evacuate her so that they wouldn't expose the whole search and rescue team to the uh, additional hazards of, of more loose, loose, wet, slow snow coming down on top of them. Um, so again, a very, very close call. This could have definitely been a fatality, um, but fortunately it wasn't. Um, it was a pretty bad injury. As you can see, he's, he's, he's holding his broken ski. So, you know, even a wet slide, which might not be moving as fast as a, a dry wintertime avalanche, can still have a tremendous amount of force to snap a ski like that. So going to talk a little bit about these avalanches. So you hear us talking about on the advisory, loose wet avalanches pretty often. Um, these are otherwise known as point releases, wet point releases, wet sloughs. Um, they typically start at a small point, just a little bit of snow starting to fall, and then they can enlarge and entrain quite a lot of snow as it moves downhill, uh, forming like a, a fan-shaped avalanche. Some of these are pretty benign and inconsequential. They're, they can just be coming off a small slope and you just see some roller balls. Uh, but if they're on a steep slope for that's continuously long, they can continue to build up more and more snow, especially if they go through a couloir or a gully where they can start piling up higher and higher. Now uh, they can be quite dangerous. Um, here's a video um, that was taken this year uh, on March 27th um, on climbing up Mount Morrison on an eastern, uh, eastern aspect as things were warming up. So this is triggered by a, just a skier on a skin track, just slipping off the skin track a little bit. So just a ski length wise piece of snow. Um, as you can see, it, it kept going down the slope pretty impressively. Mm -hmm. And then we kept on thinking it was going to stop, but it just kept going. Damn, that's a good little start, man. So you can see it went down in this constriction and picked up even more snow, swept off on the side. And so you can, you can imagine if someone was actually climbing this slope underneath us, um, they could have definitely been taken for a pretty big ride and potentially buried underneath us. Okay. Um. Uh, excuse me, a little technical difficulty here again. Uh, all right. Um, excuse the technical difficulties. I think by this time in this pandemic, we have this all dialed. Um, this is uh, that same day, actually, after going down the west slope of Mount Morrison and coming out by Convict Lake, um, we came across the bottom of the Mendenhall Couloir, which is this big couloir coming off the, uh, the Laurel Mountain there, coming right down the lake. We looked up and we saw this huge uh, debris pile at the, at, the, at the base that we hadn't seen that morning. And then right after that, a skier came down beside it in this little side gully and came down and looked at it and we were like, oh my, geez, like did someone get buried in this? And uh, this guy came down to us and, and told us basically he was way up high in the, in the couloir at a, at a rocky choke uh, where he was off on the side down climbing some rocks and this slide released naturally above him. And uh, fortunately he was off to the side at that moment and it, it funneled down and went down and uh, it didn't take him, but it had it happened you know, a few minutes earlier, a few minutes later when he was actually in the, in the gut of the couloir, you, know, you can tell that he would have been taken for a pretty massive ride and potentially buried in that heavy debris. So another really close call. 
um, it was a, it was a warming day. The suns were out, and um, um, he he was descending the slope uh, after noon time. About I think it was one o'clock, which is was fairly late for an east facing aspect like that. And um, I think he he definitely learned that that was too late to be in there. Um, so there's wet loose releases and there's also wet slab avalanches, which you can see in this picture, there's actually crown lines involved. And typically these happen when there's a buried weak layer or a, a sliding surface or an ice crust. Uh, so typically these are started by loose wet point releases and then there's enough force to actually trigger a slab avalanche. And you can, um, you can tell that these could be much more consequential and can cover a lot more of an expanse of a slope. And not, um, so these are something definitely to be looking out for, the potential for these things. Um, this actually happened, uh, I think in 2018, this is the crown of a wet slide that happened because of rain falling on the snowpack. Um, and this is in the Telly Bowls up uh, on Punta Bardeen, right outside of Mammoth. And this actually ripped out very, very wide above both of the Telly Bowls. So, you know, many hundreds of feet wide and uh, you can see how thick the crown was there. So unfortunately no one was around when this happened, but had someone been caught in it, that, that would not have been a good thing at all. Here's another one that happened that same year, 2018. This is the backside of Mammoth, uh, right off the Bogondola station on the top. And this is a, what they call Fresno Bowl. And uh, this is a Western uh, aspect in the Scully. And it's actually a Northwesterly facing slope that you're looking at here. Um, and again, the, the, the rainstorm that, um, that triggered this avalanche and the patrol up there who have been there for 20, 30 years have never seen an avalanche like this happen in that, in that bowl. It's not as steep as, you know, you think it might not even be steep enough to slide, but it, it was. So another, you know, rain on snow event. Uh, we mentioned earlier um, these weak faceted snow that we had mid season, early season in our in our snowpack. Uh, you can see this this uh, the snow density um, profile with these smaller layers in the bottom, which indicates dent less dense, weaker snow. Um, they've not been something we've been thinking about for quite a long time, but uh, and they've been gaining strength, but there's still weaker snow down there, and so this could come into play with uh, when it, if we had another rain on snow event, um, the snowpack could get really saturated and it could fail and have a quite some large avalanches failing on these early season layers that are underneath the snowpack still. We'll see, we'll see what happens, but it's definitely something to keep in mind with a you know, very, very warm day that might trigger deeper instabilities. So things that affect wet slabs or wet point releases, um, you know, the, the daily weather, it, one day can be completely different than another day. Um, sunshine is a huge factor, direct sunshine heating up a slope. So east facing slopes in the morning, southerly facing slopes through midday, west facing slopes in the afternoon. Um, with full sunshine, those things are gonna get quite, quite moist. Um, but then there's wind uh, and wind can cool them down. So things that might get moist and wet um, up high might not because the winds are blowing and cooling it down. Um, and then cloud cover, of course. So if the clouds are covering up the sun, um, the sun might not be intense, as intense, so things might not loosen up as much. But on the other hand, on north-facing slopes, which are more shady, uh, typically the clouds can keep in heat, actually. And so even, um, so you think clouds might overall keep everything cooler, but that's not always the case on more northerly aspects. Uh, they might actually warm up more than you might expect. And then especially at nighttime, um, I'll get into that here. So you can see um, this is a, Google Earth image of Mount Morrison, these different aspects. So this east face over here will heat up in the morning and then the west face over here will heat up in the afternoon. So you wanna make sure your timing um, is good. So going up these slopes when things are frozen and firm and not li risking loose wet slides, uh, but then you wanna ski down them too before they get too wet. Uh, so it's a very narrow window and sometimes you'll be going up a slope and uh, you'll be noticing, oh, it's getting a little bit wetter than I thought this uh, and we're a little behind the ball. And uh, it's important to be able to just turn around and, and pull the plug and, and ski down before the thing gets too wet. So overnight refreeze also plays into this. Um, and two factors really play into this is, uh, is how the air temperatures overnight. Um, for the past couple of weeks, we've been having air temperatures uh, hovering around you know, the mid thirties at mid elevation. So not really getting below freezing. However, we've, the clouds have really been um, not there at nighttime and, and the clear nights have literally allowed the, uh, the heat to escape from the snowpack. And even though the air temperatures are warmer than freezing, this, the snowpack has been freezing on the surface. Um, it'll freeze more the colder the air temps are, um, but it'll freeze, a, it'll, it'll 
decrease a whole lot in their freezing if there's actually cloud cover at night, which keeps in the radiation, the heat into the snowpack and doesn't allow that heat to escape. And uh, so if you have a really cloudy night, especially with warm temperatures, we might wake up and the, it might already be wet in the morning when we walk out the door and it's on the snow. Um, so it's important to keep track of those things. So there's, there's sensors um, on our ESAC website you can look at under resources down here. There's a weather sensor app you can pull up and it'll give you graphs of different weather sensors all over our forecast range. And you can see what the temperatures got down to at night and see what they rose up to. And uh, so you can compare that as to, to previous days and how, how you saw the snow reacting to that and give you a better idea to do your own forecast for the, the coming up day. Um, there's also um, snow surface temperature sensor. Um, this, many people don't know about this, but this is kind of a handy tool to use. It's only on Mammoth Mountain, and I'll give you a little demo of it right here. Um, hopefully you all can still see this. This is the Mammoth um, Mountain uh, patrol site, and at the bottom here there's a UCSB link. If you click on that, and there's a, a snow sensor that's behind mid station there under responsive charts and surface temperatures. You can actually see what the surface of snow temperatures it's gotten to, and you can expand the range from one day to, to many days. So this is 180 days. This is a diurnal cycle. So you can see each day the snow surface gets to zero degrees when the sun comes out and the, the temp air temperatures are warm. But every night it drops. And so when it's, the air temperature has been cold, they've been dropping down to negative 14 or even negative 16. But more recently, above, above, uh, above freezing temperatures, the snowpack is still dropping to about negative six degrees every night. Um, if we had some very thick cloudy skies, these temperatures might not drop even below freezing. So it's something, this is a nice little tool to look at. So keep that in mind again, it's only for one point, but um, it's a useful tool. Um, <clears throat> so then we can go right back to wintertime in the springtime too with a new snowstorm. Um, and this goes right back to our wintertime concerns of wind slabs and storm slabs. So if you get all of a sudden a storm of six inches a foot, even more maybe, um, there's some things on the long range forecast right now that towards the end of April, there might be some significant atmospheric rivers on the, on the horizon. I'm not going to talk too much about it because I don't want to jinx it, but um, yeah, there could be some more moisture coming our way. There's at least a hint of it. So that's, that's better than the next week or two, which look pretty dry. Um, but a big storm comes in, it's going to go right back to wintertime when it's storming in terms of wind slabs and storm slabs, especially on icy crusts that are out there. Uh, but then as soon as the storm stops and the sun comes out, that's going to be a really dangerous time to be out in the mountains with the rapid warming that occurs, as you can see in that Paiute Craig's video. Um, fresh snow and then really quickly rising temperatures um, are something to definitely be very aware of and to not push, push the limits on days like that. So the warning signs when you're out there, um, looking around at the, at, the, at the mountains, if you see some recent, recent loose activity, like you can see in this picture, this is up in the Baldwin Cirque just last week that Mike actually got a picture of. Um, these were all pretty recent slides that he saw, a warm, you know, warmer day and these little, little loose point releases um, came off these rocks and, and definitely entrained enough snow to make a considerable avalanche. Here's another little release over here. And rollerballs coming down the slope, pinwheels that build up and get into these big shapes. This is actually a pretty cool one I saw. It was actually a rollerball and then it sat around for a while and melted out in the middle. So I thought it'd be fun to take a <laughs> picture of my buddy skiing through it. Um, but, and sinking into the snow really deeply. You can see this guy up to his waist. If you know the snow is portable in the morning, you might not even be barely kicking your boot tip in and crampons are necessary. But uh, as soon as things start warming up a lot, and if they're warming up to the point where you're you know, punching into your knee or even deeper, your waist, uh, it's definitely not a time you want to be on a steep slope, seek shade of your terrain. <clears throat> Couloirs are their own um, beast because they're basically a big funnel. Like the, all kinds of things can come down these things and funnel into a narrow area. They don't, they don't have a lot of room to move around and dodge things. You can see this picture up here. Um, things can come off of all these different aspects. So this like easterly aspect in the morning might be loosening up and funneling down and in the afternoon, maybe more of this side will be funneling down. Uh, so climbing up this little narrow couloir um, when things are heating up is not a good idea. Um, and so, you know, reducing your exposure uh, is very important in that. Um, and they're great to ski. Um, but be smart, go up them really early before they warm up and, and get down them also before they start warming up too much. 
terrain traps are another issue to always worry about in terms of avalanches and in the springtime as well. You can see this gully, even though it's a small little gully, uh, probably just, you know, 50 feet, 100 feet. Um, but there's a lot of snow in this gully and even a, a small slope can get get buried. You can get buried quite deeply in a, in a gully like this. This is down in uh, the southern, more southern sea outside of Big Pine and it's coming off of Tinimaha Mountain. And there's just some some wet avalanche that came down quite a bit earlier than when we were there, but it was just a, like a, a river, obviously. I mean, the huge, huge sidewalls uh, that happened with this slide. Um, definitely not somewhere you want to be when it's actually happening. <clears throat> now there's another concern besides just the avalanches and the weather and the terrain. Uh, it's people um, and how to manage your own group. Like if you're up there climbing a couloir or on a slope with two, three, four people, um, you want to be really sure you're only exposing one person at a time. Uh, again, climbing up the slopes, it's hard not to be climbing up on top of each other. Um, but hopefully you're doing that at a time when the slope is firm and the slope is not going to slide. Uh, but when it's time to ski, things are looser and sometimes they might be looser than is ideal. So definitely ski one at a time, wait for your partner to, to pull off to the side and get behind a rock or somewhere with a few triggers, some loose slide, it's not gonna take them out. Um, so planning, talking, communicating is, is an important thing, just as important in the winter, um, but definitely important in the springtime. And then another thing these days, with uh, especially with the popularity increasing in the backcountry, um, the Sierras has always been a very vast range and you can often get out there and not see a single other person, but more and more there's there's people, multiple groups uh, going out to ski the same objectives. Um, and this can definitely pose a whole new problem, like climbing up a couloir. This is uh, a couple pictures from a day a couple years ago. Um, there was a, we were going to ski a, a couloir up, uh, up in the, about a bridge port. And there's a party already going up it and we were debating like, well, they're, they're setting this boot pack. It'll be easier booting for sure, but uh, we don't want to be in this thing when they're, when they're skiing it. And so we were, luckily the boot pack really hugged the edge of the couloir. Um, and as we were getting up about three quarters of the way, the party above us decided to start skiing down. And we were like, hey, wait up a second. And so we moved off to the very edge. Um, and sure enough, they started skiing down and they triggered a, a small slab. Um, you can see the run out down here. Um, it, it could have been could have been bad news if, if you're booting right up in the middle of that couloir when they're skiing down on top of us. Um, so perhaps we should have just changed our mind that day. We should have like realized like it's not worth that risk of us getting caught in a slide on there. Let's go ski something else. Um, last week, another friend of mine was skiing a couloir and uh, it was a popular day and uh, two other parties were climbing up behind him and they were climbing up this couloir um, and things were getting warm and they were not comfortable continuing up. They were like, it's getting too warm. It's time to turn around and ski. And they turned around and they saw two parties way below them in this couloir. And they're like, well, geez, now what do we do? Like here we are stuck up in this couloir. If we start skiing down, we might cause these loose slides to come down and take those people out. But at the same time, we don't want to stay up here anymore because we might be getting taken out by a wet slide. And, um, it's just a, a tricky situation to be in. Um, so I think it's really important to be aware of your surroundings, not only just the, the physical surroundings, but also the people and to communicate and to, to realize that uh, it's, it might be worth not booting up that couloir and finding something else to ski if someone else is in front of you. This is uh, another situation that occurred in 2017 on the east face of Mount Morrison. Uh, this is a, a hiker, actually. He was snowshoeing and mountain climbing. He wasn't planning on skiing, but he uh, got up to Mini Morrison, the little smaller mountain next to it, um, kind of late in the morning, but wanted to go up to Big Morrison. And so he made it all the way up to within about 300 feet of this ridge line uh, when there was a, a party of two that were skiing uh, on the summit that were ready to ski down. And they were skiing and they were going to go ski something other some other slope further lookers left on this thing but as they were traversing across uh there's just a little bit of slough on their skis was enough to create quite a big wet um wet slough and avalanche and he was actually taken from about 300 feet below the ridge line all the way down through here and was ended up partially buried down here tweaking a knee but fortunately he was able to still hike out on his own um this is a day um april let's see like three to 12 inches of new snow happened on april 18th um and then the first warm day, several days later, it warmed up to 40 degrees. And sure enough, that's when this day happened. Um, heading down an east slope at 2 p.m. is, is pretty late in the day. Um, again, this guy learned a lot about that kind of uh, loose, wet danger on that day. Unfortunately, he walked out. 
So takeaways from Spring Avalanche. Spring Avalanche is uh, recognize that stability can change rapidly within an hour. It can go from totally stable to like, nope, this is not a place you want to be. Pay attention to the overnight refreeze. Um, you know, if there's a really overly warm day, things are going to soften up and be dangerous much, much quicker on a day if it's going to be a really cold night or cloudy skies again. Um, pay attention to today's weather forecast. How warm is it going to get? Is it going to be cloudy or sunny? What are the winds doing? Um, the winds, you know, can keep a, a, a slope firm and not only are avalanche cons avalanches a concern, but um, if a slope stays really frozen up and locked up, that's a steep slope, um, it could be a dangerous skiing situation too. So it's not only avalanches, but just think about what you have to travel on. Start early in the springtime. Um, you know, it's way better to wait for an hour and a half on top of a mountain for things to soften than to be too late and to be stuck in a dangerous situation. And again, don't hesitate to turn around. You feel those conditions getting too wet. Um, it's time to pull the plug. That mountain's going to be there another day. And again, just expose one at a time when you're skiing uh, and minimize your exposure when you're climbing up these things. So this point, we'd like to open up to any questions for this part. We'll continue on with some more travel advice other than avalanches, but just wanted to see if there's any questions out there before we continue on. Josh, we have a good one from Ben Gerber. He's asking, on a sunny day without wind, are east-facing aspects still a concern later in the day? It depends on the elevation. And, and as the spring goes on more towards summer, the sun angle gets higher and higher. Um, so right now, um, up until now, they, they definitely there's a window where they start refreezing. So they'll be up at least above you know, 10,000 feet or so. There's no hard lines with elevation. Um, but they'll start to refreeze typically. But as the temperatures get warmer and the high temperatures are, are getting up into the 50s and, and beyond, um, and the sun angle gets higher and they're still hitting those eastern slopes even in the afternoon, um, they'll, they'll still be concerning. So it's, it's, a, it's a constantly gradually changing um, situation. Um, so as, as the season progresses, yeah, those east facing slopes at four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, they can be real manky and not places you want to ski. Josh, you've touched on, on timing pretty well. And Ethan has a question about another observation to make, which is what's a good indicator with boot penetration or ski penetration when the, when the snow is too soft? I think he's Steve. asking what the threshold is there. It's a good question. Steve, you want to take this one? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so typically, you know, part of the reason we want to start early is to – catch that melt early on. So as that boot penetration increases, you know, ankle to boot depth. Um, so, you know, more than a couple inches of boot penetration is when I start to think that it's happening quickly. And I, I start thinking about turning around. Um, but it, certainly if you're sinking your foot into the snow, then it's probably already past that time. That's that's definitely sort of I guess my metric for it's time to go or it's, it was time to go a little while ago. Um, so generally, I like to try and time it so that I'm getting that surface melt under maybe two inches. Uh, but that's more of a ski penetration, I guess. With with boot penetration specifically, I'd say ankle to to full boot depth. Yeah, if you start sinking into your your knee and thigh. Uh, consistently, that's that's probably your your uh, probably should be somewhere else. Um, but it's also like if you're around shallow rocks, you might punch down every now and then to your to your knee, your thigh, just in a shallow spot of the snowpack. But other places, you might still be very supportable and less than boot top. Um, yeah, you're looking for that consistent um, boot penetration. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for the question. It's a good one, and there is no absolutely defining line but uh i think what steve said is a, is a good guideline yeah josh with our with our season winding down here and the temperatures warming up you you touched on the layering of the snowpack a little bit and jacob has a a great question about wet slabs and whether or not you anticipate there being a wet slab problem this spring and if so, what are some ways to understand when they should be on our radar for when the avalanche forecasts the daily advisories stop? 
Another, another great question. Um, I, they're on my radar, um, especially with this early season um, week layers we've had. Um, and even without those, it's possible to have wet slabs. Um, but I would, the thing is about the, the wet slab, loose wet, it's all in the same realm. So you don't have to, I would worry about a, a wet slab problem just as much as loose wet. You don't know, um, it's just a different, different, uh, different degree. Um, so basically the same, same things go into wet slabs in terms of like boot penetration, warming up snow, things becoming unsupportable. Um, you might not see as many rollerballs coming off of slopes because that's typically when snow is fresher. Um, but definitely boot penetration and, and looking for days that are especially, especially warm out with low refreeze at night. Um, I would just, you know, play safe, get on and off of them early. And um, just always assume that like, you know, if loose wet stuff is happening and it's, and you're sinking into your knee and beyond that, you know, a wet slab might be possible. Um, and again, most, those might happen more on more northerly, like northeast, north, northwest slopes, where there's still these weak layers. And um, right now, still east slopes as well. Things are still transitioning. Um, but where, there, where you can actually see the snowpack where it hasn't been totally isothermal and everything has just gone to a, like a kind of a consistent frozen in, in the night and, and wet and moist in the daytime. Um, so those transitional slopes are probably much, what are going to be more concerning. Steve, do you have anything to add to that one? Yeah, I, would, I guess the only thing I'd kind of add to that would be some big red flags would be or a, a very warm temperatures at night and we don't get that refreeze. Um, those would be, I guess, two of the big red flags for pushing it more into that wet slab um, realm. Because what we need there is, is more moist Or also, um, something like a renowned snow event would do it. But otherwise, what Josh said was great. Like, there's, it is, it is kind of a, a game of degree, right? Where we get, we start with those er surface instabilities, but the warmer it gets, um, that's when we start worrying about that deeper, those deeper instabilities. Awesome. I think that's all we have for now. And uh, don't forget, we'll have a more opportunity as we keep going forward. Oh, we have one more that popped up. Um, we have some folks asking about conditions and maybe this could just be a, a sidebar conversation. So why don't you carry on? All right, Steve, take it away. All right. Well, thanks, Josh. Um, so I'm going to touch on a few more. Turns uh, not not necessarily avalanche related, but into traveling in the mountains. Josh, can you go to the next slide or maybe I'm... Oh. Great, so... Um, one big whoop, one big thing to think about is um, again we're going to emphasize again and again both in advisories and, and right now that um, in the in the springtime here you know that lower we get that but with that comes um, a lot of firm snow overnight refreeze we're often traveling on snow that has melted and frozen multiple times. Um, so with, you know, when we're approaching firm snow, we want to be aware that, you know, if it doesn't melt again, um, it's going to be particularly challenging to um, 
to ski or travel on that terrain. We want to think about the equipment we might want to bring to approach these, these hard and slick surfaces, um, whether they be crampons for your boots or ski crampons as well, um, as well as ice axes or maybe a whippet. Um, helmets are always a good idea all season long, but even, but in the springtime, you know, if there's loose snow falling around, it's, it might likely be ice, which might feel more like a rock, um, something like that. So I definitely think about the potential for slide for life conditions on the ascent, um, particularly, but even on the descent, um, especially if it doesn't start to melt. Um, and yeah, definitely pronounced X thing like, common common things in my backpack so i actually stuck this one in here so uh, this is a yeah go for it no sorry go ahead go ahead steve well i i, uh, I like this photo as well it's a you know sometimes our gear is, you know as as good as it is could use some modifications and and strapping these this bamboo to these ski crampons was designed to kind of help um and engage the cramp on even on a steeper skin track. So a lot of times with those firm surfaces, it can be hard to kind of dig the edge of the ski in. And um, the ski cramp ons will help kind of with that side hilling, but often it pushes us into a steeper skin track. And uh, this is a good way to kind of engage the entire cramp on for those steeper slopes. So I thought this was a pretty creative way to address that. Um, and again, just kind of talking about the, those bigger days, you know, often in the springtime, we're out of there before me, and, um, at the latest, but and start moving in the dark. Um, and that, you know, really kind of takes some some effort in considering our timing on, you know, when to start, when to approach those slopes, when to ski by, you know, being cognizant of when to turn around. Um, and also just using our, our resources to trip plan um, before we head out. So whether that be, you know, looking at maps in our route or maybe some homework before we actually go out for the objective to make sure that we're gonna be moving in the right direction, even if it's dark out. Um, all those can be really important factors when approaching these bigger days. Um, and this one kind of factors into avalanches as well, but the but cornices, do, when things start warming up, these cornice features that have been building all winter long and in some cases grow very large, um, can start to, they get a lot weaker and can start shedding in the springtime when things warm up. So being aware of where those are and um, also being aware that they can often break uh, quite a ways back from the edge of them. Um, they can actually, you know, sometimes 20, 30 feet. I've seen cornices break that are were the size of, of a school bus. I've known folks who've gone for big falls. When you're standing above this um, and wonderful when approaching those. And on that same note, you know, this is another good reason to be cognizant of how things are changing in the morning. If you're climbing up underneath a cornice feature, um, they're much more likely to kind of break and fall on their own with the warming. Um, so if you find anything, continue to think about because these are very condensed quite dangerous and also to, to add on this one this person standing on top of that cornice that's uh that's too close to the edge on that one he's uh that that's something that's just a demonstration of uh yeah. where not to be <laughs> Um, yeah, this one's actually huge. Uh, stream crossings start to come back out in the springtime. And um, especially right now, I've been noticing a lot of this where 
um, things that used to be covered are no longer covered. So a lot of those obstacles that we talk about in the, in the early season, whether it be open stream crossings or rocks and logs, those can all be kind of re-emerging in the spring. Um, and stream crossings in particular, often like you can see the snowshoe here with the dog down there and um, even that person on the upper right side of your screen. Um, you know, often the bridge of it can look um, thick and portable, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's not kind of teetering right at the edge. So we want to be really careful when you approach um, these stream crossings and being kind of ready for that. And that goes back to that trip planning. If um, and you're expecting an easy snow bridge, you kind of want to have a, you might, you might end up looking around for that for a while. So another reason to start earlier than you might, might expect. Yeah, and then going back to this, this is a great photo. I've, I've, uh, I've seen some of this out this, this week even um, with just really kind of unconsolidated wet snow, especially in more sheltered areas, lower elevations. Um, and so one thing to think about this stuff is that, uh, you know, once you ski your objective um, in the Alpine, often going back to the car, you're going to run into all these things again. Um, but you're likely to run into them with less frozen snow. So you might um, find it quite easy and some portable snow moving uh, in the morning when you're starting in the dark or early morning. Um, but on the, in the afternoon when you're heading home, you might be traveling in this deep, unconsolidated wet snow. And that can sometimes makes for really challenging ski conditions. Um, so being kind of cognizant of that the day is not over once you get the line in. You still have to kind of make the exit back down to the snow line or to the car. Oh, and the bushwhacking, plenty of bushwhacking. Um, yeah, this, is, this can be an interesting factor as well. As those lower elevations um, kind of melt out, we start to see lots of bare patches and, and kind of these ribbons of snow. And they're, they're often not exactly where we want them to be, but we get sucked into them because they're slidable. Um, so definitely slowing down and being careful moving through this stuff. Um, you know, catching a ski tip on a, on a tree or even just a branch that might be kind of poking up out of the snow can, can definitely lead to an injury or, a, or just kind of a bad day in general. Um, but being prepared for all of the, the shenanigans that goes along with springtime travel is important. <laughs> and then, of course, the sun. We live, you know, in Southern California and um, we have amazing sunny days down here. Um, I know personally my face is, has been burnt for a while and um, reapplying the sunscreen often is important. Um, but also those passive ways of, of blocking the sun, whether they be the sun hoodies or um, kind of long sleeves. And uh, I even have sun gloves that I use um, when my ski gloves are too warm. Um, but you, Protecting yourself from the sun can be super important. And one thing to mention here with the snow is uh, the, the snow reflects quite a bit of that, that radiation as well. So being, per, being aware that you can also, you know, some people can burn their eyeballs or the inside of their nose or under, you know, inside of their mouth. Um, so being aware that the sun's coming at you from all angles when you're traveling on the snow. Um, and it's way more intense with these longer days in the spring. So take extra precautions. And then, you know, this, I think this is, this is good advice for any time of the season, but, um, you know, as we're going in these bigger days and further out into the backcountry and, and kind of pushing for those bigger objectives, um, really being prepared for the unexpected is important. So having that, maybe a, 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 a sled that you can carry in your backpack or um, an, a uh, in-reach device or one of those spot devices, a personal locator beacon so you can call out for help from the search and rescue. All those kinds of things can be really, really beneficial. And, and sometimes they feel unnecessary when you don't need them. 
Um, but speaking from experience, as soon as you do, you're going to be really grateful for, for carrying it every day. So personally, I have you know, carried most of this stuff every day of the season and, and I, I can shift certain things around depending on where I'm going or what time of year it is. Um, but making sure your repair kit works for the skis you're on or the snowboard you're on. Uh, um, you really, really in preparing for that what if you know, it's it's easy to have good days and, and not think about um what could go wrong you know and what you would do if it did but really kind of sitting down with your your partners and discussing those those factors of you know, what would we do if this happened? And then making a plan to address that. Um, and, and if you call for search and rescue with whether you have cell phone service or one of those satellite messenger devices, and you might have to provide patient care or, um, or maybe start to move out on your own. So being prepared for that type of situation can be really important. And with that, I think we'll open up for some more questions. Awesome. Yeah, we have a couple um, for you guys. One coming from Ian, who's asking um, any suggestions for assessing safety of a snow bridge river crossing. So anything you do to check that out. Personally, if I'm approaching a snow bridge, um, I approach it slowly, I poke at it with my poles and, and uh, kind of as if it's going to break under my feet. So I approach it really quickly and then I try to uh, get across, you know, gently but carefully. Um, so it, I guess it's sort of a, it depends thing in their options, like maybe a log across the creek or, or some rocks up. through the snow. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know, if Josh, if you have anything to add to that, but for me, it's more of a, it's situational and I heard it with caution. Sounds about right to me. Yeah. Yeah, looking upstream and downstream at, the, at that bridge can be helpful too, right? To get another perspective to see how thick it is and what's underneath it. Absolutely. That's a really good point. Um, another one for you guys is, are there any pointers to understanding the snowpack conditions in a couloir if you're not boot packing it? So for example, a couloir could be either the same or a different aspect to use to get on top of it. Um, really looking to understand if the couloir snowpack could be icy, neve, or isothermal. So how, how do you judge what a, what a couloir is like if you're not going up it? Yeah, that's that's a great question too. And you know, I think there's there's kind of two schools of thought, right? There's a, there's a certainly a population out there who will always want to climb the slope they want to ski. And you know, I can speak from my own experience that often, you know, more often than I might expect, I am I'm facing that time crunch and feeling the snow. Um, softening quicker than I expected and often I'm not making it to the top so that is one thing to keep in mind if you decide to climb via a different route is that you might um, find yourself on top and already be too late um, in which case you might have to find another way down um, so in that respect you know there there is a huge benefit to climbing the slope you want to ski um, but again you know similar to the stream crushing crossings if you're dropping into a line and you haven't felt the snow yet and then it's exposed and if it if there's you know worry that it might be icy i'd approach that really cautiously and slowly um you know i definitely don't want to jump into something without my first feeling it out especially here gosh you got anything to add to that i'm not sure if i really 
Yeah, I think it's it's you know looking at the looking at the the topo map and seeing the aspect of it and realizing that one you know even a ten foot wide couloir uh, can be quite different on the left side than the right side just on how the shading of the rock is and it can really vary a lot. But you know if you want to try to try your best to look at the topo map and see what the little aspect the slight variations are to help give yourself an idea. Um, but like Steve said, yeah, climbing up them has its pros and cons. You're exposed to rock fall if you're climbing up it and stuff coming down on top of you more. So it's, it's, you're spending more time in this, in this gun site that might be funneling stuff down on top of you. Um, but I think also, I mean, there's been more than, you know, uh, well, a handful of couloirs have, have started in from the top and come down to something I didn't expect and having had to stop and boot back out of the thing. So uh, that's that's a possibility too. If you don't go down, don't go up at first. So keep your flexibility open, and um, yeah, don't feel like you're just because you started skiing down this thing, you can take your skis off and boot back up it, unless you're facing with the wet concern. And in that case, you want to do your best to manage your slough and get out of there. You know, and there's also you know there's there are ways to kind of get down into it, whether you be on the wet. Like maybe if you brought a rope and and um, have those type of skills, you can kind of go and feel it out before you commit to it. But um, yeah, it's definitely a different way, kind of consideration to come in from the top versus from the bottom. Um, but, you know, I think the basics are kind of the same. Like if you have a way to get in there safely and, and feel it out, you still want to look for those same signs of, of extensive warming and, and those, you know, uh, be, you know, consider those, um, cornices and things like that. So, yeah, I think uh, in the springtime we we start to branch out a little bit further with the longer days and the easy travel in the morning, especially. And uh, we we start to you know branch out a little bit more into terrain that requires a little bit more um, you know mountaineering skills in addition to your ski and avalanche skills. And we have a, a good question here about that, which is how can you assess weak snow on early season backpacking trips, such as crossing steep snow fields? Um, so maybe a little bit more of a, a mountaineering focus there. Any recommendations on transitioning into the summer? Josh, you wanna take this one? Uh Sure, I'll, I'll start it off and get stuff to add. Uh, you know, it's the same thing as if you have skis on your feet, honestly. Um, skis let you travel over snow a lot better if it's starting to soften without so much post holing. So just in terms of travelies, boy, I'd much prefer to be on skis and, than, than shoes almost any day. But, um, but in terms of the stability of the snowpack, it's the same thing as you're looking at as if you were going to ski it. Um, so, you know, how much your boots penetrating. If you're on a backpacking ship, you know, look at your passes and your aspects and Maybe that, you know, you're camping out underneath a, an east-facing slope, um, and the next morning you're trying to climb this slope, maybe not go first thing in the morning, let it soften a little bit so you can get some boot penetration and not go for a slide for life. Um, then you get on top of it, you got to go down the other side. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of complex issues you got to deal with, and uh, timing, is, timing is key about when, when you're going to go up and down a slope, not wanting to be on a slope when it's too, too wet and soggy that you might get taken out in a wet slide. Um, and then just be prepared with, uh, if you're doing, you know, backpacking in those types of conditions, bringing those micro spikes for your shoes and an ice axe. Um, those are smart tools that I have with you. Awesome. Uh, we have one last question here, which um, regarding traveling around to other parties and whether you have any suggestions descending if you're the one at the top and the other party is traveling uphill, especially when it's getting later in the day. And I think that was part of the, the story that you recounted there, Josh, about uh, the uphill party needing to consider what was going on down below them. Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of the you know, a lot of the responsibility, I think, for that type of a situation probably falls onto the party who's coming in later. Um, in that, because because it can be hard to shift once you're climbing. 
once you're above, I suppose. Um, and the law, you know, it's one of those where it affects both parties uh, maybe equally in that as the party above, you know, I'm, I'm on a timeline to get out of there before it reaches a place where it's unstable and unsafe for me to be on that slope. But I'm also concerned about kicking something on to the lower party, right? So there's kind of two factors of safety there. Uh, but it, it is certainly one of those situations where we want to um, be really cautious, um, especially as that second party. You know, if I know for, for me, if I'm coming in and, and um, someone's quite a ways above me and, and, you know, maybe we're moving the same speed or whatever, and I'm not going to get to the top with them, then I, I'm starting to look for different options uh, because, you know, for my safety as the second party, I'm, I'm concerned with them kicking something onto me. Um, you know, these loose, loose wet avalanches in particular, or at least dry avalanches are similar that um, they often start from, from, from whatever initiates it. Right. So if I'm, if, if I trigger it on my skis, it's going to start below me. Um, so for me, as the one triggering it, it, as long as I'm skiing safely and slowly and being cautious, you know, that's a relatively easy hazard to manage. Um, but as we saw in the video Josh played from the east face of Morrison, you know, that relatively small slough that um, wasn't too concerning picked up quite a bit of speed and quite a bit of snow. And if anyone had been in that gully below, uh, below them that day, that could have been um, quite the shock. It would have happened really fast. And it was a lot of snow that could have certainly taken someone for a ride and potentially buried them. So, um, you know, for me, if I am looking up and there's someone else in that cooler, I'm going to try to shift my goal um, or maybe think about a different way to get on top of that line um, to stay out from underneath them. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes with these spring objectives, we get up early, we, we're going a long distance, and we have sort of this main objective in our head of where we want to be. But it's important to have those kind of plan B, plan C um, for situations just like that. And, you know, maybe plan C is turning around. And it certainly um, can be painful in the moment, but I, you know, I've never regretted turning around later. Uh, but I guess specifically, you were asking about the, being the top party and and that's a really tricky one because, um, as I mentioned, like the longer you wait for them to maybe catch up, if you are already seeing signs or maybe you, you even turned around before the top because it was getting kind of sketchy, um, you don't really want to sit there and wait. Um, so, I mean, trying to avoid being right on top of them, you know, try to communicate if you can. Um, but, yeah, all those can be really frustrating and challenging, but it's certainly – you know, something we all need to think about out there. Awesome. That's all the questions we have now. Great. Thanks for the explanation, Steve. I think you covered that really well. So finally, we just want to give a bunch of thank yous out for, for you know, we're nearing the end of our season here. We're, um, our last advisory is going to be April 16th. We're going to go daily advisories until then, but then, uh, then advisories are going to, going to stop. We have our summer jobs to go. The funding is funding is running out, um, but we'll leave up on their website, uh, some springtime travel advice. So a lot of stuff will cover, be covered here. We'll, we'll leave uh, we'll leave a link to this video on the, the final advisory page. That'll stay open uh, through until summertime. Um, um, but yeah, so, so right now we, we've had a great season. There are some, some challenging times, some low tide, challenging conditions, but, uh, um, you know, we all came out, knock on wood, safe and sound, uh, for the most part, there's been some accidents, uh, but people have recovered. Um, but we just hope people continue to be smart and, uh, we'll end this season with, um, no avalanche fatalities. Um, so thank yous to lots of different folks. Um, first of all, we want to thank our board. We're a nonprofit organization. Uh, we have um, about nine people on our board of directors, all volunteers, putting a, a lot of their time and energy and hearts into this program. Um, so, you know, paying for our salaries, paying for the website, paying for all kinds of different things. Uh, these guys do it um, out of their hearts. And so we just want to give a big thank you to all these guys, Forrest Cross, Neil Satterfield, Ann Logan, Nate Greenberg, Howie Schwartz, Mackenzie Long, Michelle Mather, Alan Pietrasanta, and, and Gabe Taylor. These, these people are all 
very essential parts of our program. We want to give a big thank, thank you and shout out to our, our key observers. Um, these folks, Barbara Warner, Rick Ziegler, Chris Older, Ryan Hutter, Jeff Unger, and, and Brooke Motion. They're, they're folks who are um, committed to putting in one or two observations at least a week. Um, and we are very grateful for their commitment and continued effort to give us information that they see out in the mountains when they're out there. Um, but along that same note, there's tons of observers out there. Um, anyone can be an observer if you're out in the mountains. You can see what you see and submit it to our website. A huge thank you to everyone who submits to our website so that we can learn from what they're seeing. And that goes into our forecast and advisory. Um, really crucial part of, of our operations. I want to give a huge thank you to Mike Phillips, who introduced this program, um, who's our education coordinator. The first time ever that ESAC has actually had two paid positions for people doing uh, support work, which is very essential as well. And Rachel Drattler, who has done a lot of work with grant writing and, and administrative stuff that, that is really putting our, our, our center in a position that we've never been in before. So we're really grateful for these guys. And finally, uh, thank you to everyone who's made any kind of donation to the center, big or small. Um, we really, every, every, every dollar counts. Uh, it gets put to good use. And, and all these supporters that you see listed, these emblems, these guys have given a good bit of support and find either financially or equipment. Um, we're very grateful for it all. So big, big thank yous out to everyone. And finally, thanks to all of you who've tuned in uh, and joining us. We would be wasting your time if no one showed up for this. And I hope you all learned something. Um, and please stay at, safe out there in the mountains and enjoy this wonderful springtime we have. Uh, it's quite a magical place we live in the Sierra. Um, be safe out there and uh, we'll see you all again come next winter. <laughs>